This is Dateline Tuesday. April 8, 1997. Tonight. He was John Gotti's right-hand man, a killer with no conscience, until he switched sides, spilled the mob's secrets, and helped put Gotti away. But to these women, he'll always be a murderer. His first murder was... My brother. Your brother. Yeah, that was his first murder. We always knew from day one that nobody would have killed my father except Sammy. Now the families of the 19 men he killed want to stop Sammy Gravano from making millions telling his story. As long as it doesn't go to Sammy, that is our pure satisfaction. But then, the Don Fratangelo with the controversial memoirs of a murderer. Give you this ring. They had a love that was supposed to last forever when the unthinkable happened. When I approached the car, the car was upside down. It was crunched. They survived the crash, but something else died that night. Her memories of him. I said, who's your husband, Cricket? She said, I'm not married. No memory of the man she loved or of their time together. Ann Curry explores a challenge to love few people will ever experience. Could this marriage survive? Your only chance to evacuate is to leave, leave with, us, with us. Why would anyone kill themselves for a cult? And yet, from Heaven's Gate to Jonestown. Anybody wants to get out of here, can get out of here. Where these men led, death followed. What strange spell do cult leaders cast? And could you ever fall for it? How does a cult leader like Marshall Applewhite convince smart people to join him? Dawn Fratangelo on the deadly power of persuasion. They couldn't be stopped. L.A. bank robbers in body armor shooting military-style weapons. Could this have helped police? A new eye in the sky. Meet Robo Chopper. It could have a future fighting crime and beyond. I really see it finding victims in the, in the, in the trees, in the trails, in the water. If all Tonight, Keith Morrison with a Dateline Discovery. Plus, a soggy field of dreams on Dateline's Picture of the Week. Dateline with Jane Pauley and Stone Phillips, plus Tom Brokaw, Katie Couric, and Maria Shriver. From Studio 3B in Rockefeller Center, here is Jane Pauley. Good evening. Nineteen men. He either killed or admitted taking part in their murders. But that's not what Sammy the Bull Gravano is remembered for. He's known as the man who helped put John Gotti in prison for life. But in spite of the blood on his own hands, Sammy Gravano's testimony earned him a second chance, a short prison term, and a new identity. Now, Gravano is ready to tell his stories of murder and the mob again, in a new book that, according to some reports, could earn him big money. But as Don Fratangelo tells us, the survivors of Gravano's victims say it's time to stop giving the bull second chances. Gravano cut a deal to get out from under the charges by testifying against... His fourth trial, and today the jury came back with a guilty verdict on all 13 counts. Break the mob code of silence and take the stand as a witness for the prosecution. He was vulgar. He was animalistic. He was disgusting. That's what she means by animalistic. Somebody that spits indoors, that's animalistic. I don't even want to refer to him as a person. I don't want to refer to him as an animal either because that to me is disgracing them. He decided who lived and who died. He is Salvatore Gravano. Known since his grade school days for picking on others, he earned the nickname Sammy the Bull. For two decades, he was one of the most feared men in organized crime, murdering his way up the ladder to the highest rungs of New York's Gambino crime family. But then the Bull turned rat, becoming a federal witness in one of the biggest mob trials ever. It was Gravano's testimony that put away this country's most powerful crime boss, John Gotti. Gravano got federal protection and only a five-year prison term in exchange for his testimony, which detailed the men Gravano killed and those who helped him do it. In all, Gravano murdered 19 men, including their father. He was the support of the family. And when you take away the foundation, the building crumbles. Her father. He was a loving man. He was a beautiful person. 
her father. He was a little league coach. He was very wrapped up in his children. Her brother. Okay, he was 26 years old, two small kids, got up every day, went to work. And her brother. Michael wasn't a kid that was out in the streets. He was always into athletics and all of that. Although most of these women deny the allegation, federal authorities claim their fathers and brothers all had ties to organized crime. But for these women, even raising the issue misses the point. Whether these men were good guys or bad guys is not the issue. The issue is he's turning around and trying to profit from telling his story of being a lunatic. All of these men, they were not altar boys. We are not professing them to be altar boys. But their lives mattered. Jackie Colucci was the first to lose a family member at the hands of Sammy Gravano. In 1970, Sammy the Bull shot and killed her brother, Joey. They took him for a ride, and Sammy sat in the back of the car with five bullets, and my brother starting at the head. And the next morning, Sammy, Tommy, the boys all came over crying, we're going to find out who did this to Joey. A few years after Sammy fired those shots, Roseanne Mass's brother, Michael DeBat, moved back to Brooklyn to help run their ailing father's bar. It was there Michael met Sammy the Bull. And my father told Michael once, stay with this guy, stick with this guy. This guy's going to be big someday. Father didn't know those words were going to come back to bite him. Michael developed a bad habit, drugs. His sister believed Sammy worried Michael might rat him out if arrested on a drug charge. And then Michael got worried that Sammy was worried. Two weeks before he got killed, he came to my house like 5.30 in the morning. Said, well, watch you after my daughter, be a part of her life. And then two weeks later, he was killed, Michael. He couldn't get out. There, there is no way to get out except the way he got out. Laura and Karen Garofalo's father, Edward, locked horns with Gravano in the early 1980s when Edward reportedly told Sammy he would pay a construction bill like every legitimate businessman within 60 days. Well, that was way too long for Sammy. And um, he came down to the office and he said, I think I'm just going to take your car. My dad drove a Rolls Royce and Sammy wanted this car. And my dad said, over my dead body, are you going to take this car? And what did Sammy do to your father, ultimately? Um, he was leaving his house, walking to his car, and he was gunned down. Eight, nine bullets in the back of his head, back, neck. Cindy DiBernardo, who never even met Sammy Gravano, didn't know what happened to her dad until Gravano testified he ordered the hit. I saw my father every single day of my life. I mean, speaking to him at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and him telling me I'll be home at 6 o'clock and then just never seeing him again, ever. I would have given my eyesight, I would have given body parts to have my father walk through that door again. And I'll never have that. And in the testimony, Sammy refers to your dad as a friend. A friend? He considered her his niece. He killed her father. So you tell me, what do his words mean? What do they mean? Friends coming out of his mouth is garbage. You went to Sammy right. after your dad was missing. Because um, a while back, my, my father said, if you ever need anything, go to Uncle Sammy. Gravano was a familiar face around the Melito house. So when her dad was missing, she turned to this old family friend. He said, but you know what, let me send the word out right now. My word will be like a whisper. And then uh, pretty soon uh, I'll shake buildings if your dad doesn't turn up. But don't worry, princess, everything's going to be okay. But everything was not okay. Three days earlier, as Sammy sat playing cards a few feet away from her dad, Gravano's associate shot Louis Melito once in the back of the head and once under the chin. Dina still remembers the promise Sammy made her. He says, I'll find you, Dad. Don't worry. To this day, the bodies of Louis Melito and Robert DiBernardo are still missing. What happened to the fathers and brothers of these women could have remained a secret forever. But then the FBI arrested Gravano and his boss, John Gotti, and charged them with murder. Twice before, Gotti had been acquitted, embarrassing the government. 
This time, to ensure conviction, prosecutors say they chose the lesser of two evils and cut a deal with confessed mass murderer Sammy Gravano. Federal authorities have said that it was very painful for them. Uh, my heart bleeds. Yeah. They patted him nicely on the head and said, good boy. Yeah. So you tell me how difficult must that have been for them. All of us were victimized first by Sammy Gravano. Then we were victimized by the legal system. So that's twice. And then it was uh, surfaced in the, in the newspapers that he's writing a book. And that would have been a third time. Reports that Gravano had received a six-figure advance for his memoirs united these living victims of Sammy the Bull. All feel that Gravano has earned enough blood money from the deaths of their loved ones. Did Sammy make money off your father's death? Of course he did. He acquired all my father's businesses. Did Sammy make money off your father's death? No, oh, he, the second my father was killed, he grabbed an attache, uh, attache case full of cash that my father was going to pay for my furniture for the house that he had just built me. Gravano didn't acquire anything for the murder of Roseanne Massa's brother. Instead, he consoled the grieving family with a gift. You got $500 from yeah. Sammy? That's the wake. I even have a little book. You know, when you're, you're at a wake and you have the, the booklets, it's right there. Mr. and Mrs. Sam Gravano, $500. What did you do with that $500? Hmm. We burned it. See, Sammy had to kill in order to obtain any type of money or any type of business. See, on his own, to think it out and physically do it with his hands without a gun in it, he couldn't. He didn't have the brain capacity to earn a penny without killing for it. What's more, Sammy's not even doing the heavy lifting on his own book. Instead, it's being written by Peter Moss the author of bestsellers like Serpico and the Valachi Papers. Moss refused to do an interview before the publication of the Gravano book, but he is quoted in a New York newspaper as saying, in this book there are no innocent victims. They're all mob-connected killers. That's Peter Moss. He's selling a book, so we can't take our anger out on him. May he sell his book. May the profits not go to Sammy Gravano. Absolutely. Just finding the profits may be a problem. The deal was made in England, not with Sammy Gravano, according to the publisher Harper Collins, but with Peter Moss. So to press their case, the women have hired a bull of their own, attorney Ron Kuby. Harper Collins apparently has learned a great deal about Sammy Gravano and about the way he does business. In fact, they've structured this literary deal like a mafia operation with lots of layers of insulation between the people who are making the money and the people who are paying the money in, in a conscious effort to evade and avoid the Son of Sam law. The Son of Sam law, which could be the basis of a lawsuit by the women, allows victims or their families to recover any profits made by the criminal from the crime itself, including writing about it. For Kuby, this is not the first time he's gone up against Gravano. In 1992, Kuby and his former partner, William Kunstler, tried unsuccessfully to have Gotti's conviction overturned, a conviction made possible by the testimony of Sammy Gravano. He murdered for greed, he murdered out of bitterness, he murdered out of anger, and, and I certainly don't believe that he has written this book solely in order to enlighten the American people about his role in La Cosa Nostra. He wrote this book to become a member of the Millionaire Murderers Club, and that's something we're going to stop. If Jeffrey Dahmer wanted to tell his stories of what he did to these, to these innocent people, there'd be outrage, disgust. So what makes this any different? He's a mass murderer, like any other mass murderer, so he should not profit from this. And that is the cause which has brought these women together, a cause so strong they've agreed to overlook some dark rumors. But I, and I know it's a sensitive topic, but some of you know that Sammy didn't pull the trigger on every one of these deaths, right? Right. Is it possible that the fathers of some of you or the brothers of some of you could have pulled the trigger on someone else? We acknowledge that. We had to leave that at the door. And that's where it remained. In a strange way, these women have formed a sisterhood out of their pain. They are strong, united, and defiant. You want to call this organized crime? You want to call this a mob? That's it. We are crime victims. We're our own mob. And we are going to fight until this man gets what he deserves. 
Is Gravano making a lot of money from this book or any money at all? Today, the author, Peter Moss, told Dateline he's not giving Gravano any money. And the publisher, HarperCollins, said only that its agreement is with Moss and that there's nothing unlawful about the deal. Meantime, Gravano must be pretty comfortable these days. He recently left the security of the Witness Protection Program. This is Dateline Tuesday for April 8th, with reports tonight from Keith Morrison, Ann Curry, and Dawn Pratangelo. Still ahead, it may look like a toy, but you can forget the child's play when RoboChopper takes to the air. I can have five of these things in the five trouble spots in the city at the same time. We'll show you how it works. It's a Dateline discovery. A 3.5 liter V6, 214 horses, four-wheel independent touring suspension, an advanced electronic system, 16-inch wheels and tires, and the responsiveness of auto stick. In case you're wondering just how well a Dodge Intrepid Sport handles, consider this your walkthrough. Dodge Intrepid. This changes everything. Now get 4.9% financing for 60 months or cash back. Every time your life changes, so do your taxes. Shouldn't you have someone who can help you pay less or get back more? H&R Block. new rooms. This is the story of room 30,001. Never seen a room on a truck like that. There's 30,000 rooms in Lakita's chain, and they're all like this, and this is 30,001, and I'm the driver that's doing it around the country. I'd stay there. From our studios in Rockefeller Center, here is Stone Phillips. We often take our memories for granted, but what if we lost our fondest memories all at once? The first date, the first kiss, the wedding. But what if you couldn't remember the most important person in your life? What if the person you loved became a stranger overnight? It was a knife in the back, literally. It was very devastating. It happened to them. His young wife lost her memories. How they met, how they married. When you first saw this tape then, after the accident, did you believe it was you? It was kind of weird to watch it because I don't know what the girl in the picture is thinking or feeling. Marriages survive all kinds of crises. But one like this? The story, coming up on Dateline. I picked up this dime and suddenly everything was going my way. My train showed up right when I wanted it. A woman was saving me a seat, and with one snap, the local turned express. At home was the most amazing thing. There was Candace Burden with a phone bill that made sense. It's passing through. Thanks to Sprint Sense, the dime a minute rate, I knew exactly what every call cost. As we hopped a plane for Vegas, I passed the dime on. Why should I be the only one with the phone bill that makes sense? Call now for 200 minutes free. Enterprise, hi, I'm at the repair shop. I need to rent a car. Enterprise will arrange to pick you up. This is great. Drive you to our place and get you on your way. Pick Enterprise. We'll pick you up. Eureka Bravo 2s, value price 12 amp power line plus and world pack. 12 amps and 15 inches wide to clean faster. Switch instantly for above floor. Bravo 2s, power line plus and world pack from Eureka. Our race commemorates Sir Whitmore's ill-fated expedition to the North Pole. He was told he would have better grip with wide snowshoes, but he insisted on thin. He learned a hard lesson. Wider is better. Introducing the new Wide Track Grand Prix. Its wheels are set wide for better grip to make tracks in any weather. The spirit still calls. It's in the new Wide Track Grand Prix from Pontiac. Wider is better. Beginning Thursday, 
Mrs. Carter, time to play surgeon. This is me and the baby. All new episodes. They think of a gang, man. We treat everybody the same. Saints! Hey, don't touch him! Six in a row. Oh! Carter's on fire. It's back. All right, look, just let us do our jobs, all right? All new ER, NBC Thursday. Tomorrow and today, how to ask your boss for a raise. It's a tough job, but if you do it right, they will show you the money. Tomorrow and today. North Hollywood, California, just over a month ago. Bank robbers loaded down with military-style weapons and body armor held nearly 300 police officers at bay. So much firepower going off for so long, police couldn't figure out how many gunmen there were or where they were going. But imagine if police had in their arsenal something that could scan the crime scene amidst all of the chaos without risking lives. It's an idea that may soon be jumping from the drawing board to the real world of dangerous rescues, riots, and even bank robberies. Keith Morrison has this dateline to start. In this scene from the movie Uncommon Valley, a helicopter is the only bridge between life and sure death in the battlefields of Vietnam. But in real life, away from Hollywood, helicopters really do play an important role in our lives. They're used every day to douse mountain fires, rescue people from desperate situations, and help us weave through traffic to and from work. But now, a research team at Carnegie Mellon University has set its sights on perfecting a different kind of helicopter one they hope will be used by real cops and rescue teams to save even more lives. Program coordinator Omida Midi. It's this maneuverable, self-flying platform that's in the air at your command or has a mind of its own. Ordinary helicopters are flown by hot-blooded men and women. A Midi's chopper, on the other hand, is controlled by yeah. something with a different kind of flash, has no ego, and is definitely more complex. You could say it has all the right stuff. What sets his helicopter apart is that there's no human pilot on board. The robo-chopper, as they call it, instead uses a sophisticated computer and some very high-tech systems to fly. The helicopter has two independent systems. One of them is the global positioning, GPS, which uses a constellation of satellites that are orbiting the Earth. The unmanned chopper doesn't quite have a mind of its own. Flight coordinates have to be programmed into its computer and once airborne, the computer activates the GPS and a special vision system. We put together a perception system or a vision system that can actually look at its environment and fly the helicopter. The two cameras on board monitor depth perception, enabling the chopper to fly without crashing into anything in its path. They also send images back to the command center. At about $80,000, the 150-pound robo-chopper is quite a bargain compared to normal choppers. These helicopters cost probably as much as one rotor blade of a real helicopter. Small price tag, but potentially invaluable to someone lost in a flood or the open sea. These helicopters could be deployed to go there with life jackets on it and drop the life jackets to the people. The project is still in the works, but Amidi hopes that one day his chopper will be sent unmanned into war zones and riots and on rescue missions. If you have 10 crafts, they can be flying in line together, just completely covering an area, very systematically, and one of these guys is going to find it. The robo-chopper isn't strong enough to hoist a body from the sea or a mountainside, but if trouble breaks out in multiple areas of a city, a small fleet of robo-choppers could take to the air, filming the activities on the ground. I can have five of these things and the five trouble spots in the city at the same time, and the helicopter provides images to policemen on the ground. Amidi feels that by far the most important task to come is search and rescue. Dagline decided to put the robo-chopper to the test to find out how well it performs while searching for a lost soul. In our case, a very patient mannequin in the red jacket. Plugging in the search route coordinates is the first step. When the computer has the data, the robo-chopper takes off with the GPS and the vision system fully activated. The search for the camper begins. If the helicopter is sent to a certain rough location to find a particular victim, the helicopter could easily relay back the coordinates of a point in which he has the victim in view. The chopper's eyes scanned the ground, processing 60 images per second, until it finally locked in on the camper's red jacket. The onboard computer then sends the image to the team's command center. 
armed with the capper's whereabouts, a ground team could then bring the person to safety. But when the test runs are over and the robo-chopper makes its grand entrance into the real world of search and rescue, Omida Media is convinced it's going to prove itself a true hero. I really see this thing finding victims in the trees, in the trails, in the water. I really see this craft saving people's lives. In the next few months, the Defense Department will be sponsoring tests to see if the robo-chopper lives up to its promise in the real world. In the meantime, Hollywood's calling. Two movie companies are interested in using the robo-chopper for aerial camera work. Still ahead, a love story, the likes of which you've probably never heard. They were young and in love until a car wreck took away her memory of him. You don't remember any moment, not even None of one moment. How could this marriage, any marriage, survive such a crisis? Also, I'm really happy that I made this choice. He convinced 38 people to kill themselves. Tonight, one theory on how he did it. Bonjour. No matter how you do business, uh, right this way. it makes sense to rent from Dollar. Gentlemen, I have prepared for your comfort. Dollar is right at the airport with low rates. So you can always afford to entertain your clients in style. Four. And right now at Dollar, you can rent a Dodge Neon for just $24.95 a day. Dollar Rent-A-Car. Dollar makes sense. Even though he thinks a diet soft drink never tastes as good as a regular, he's decided to try a Diet Dr. Pepper. Well, it just goes to show things aren't always what they seem. Diet Dr. Pepper tastes more like regular Dr. Pepper. My ex likes mom? I thought you liked Correcto. They changed it last year. Well, these pills are the same as always. Three out of four laxative users agree. x lax pills provide gentle, dependable overnight relief. Good morning. Sure is. x lax so dependable, it's guaranteed. This new car is powered by Dodger's 3.5-liter V6, has a four-wheel independent suspension and quick-ratio steering, which make it a perfect choice at the Skip Barber Pro Series. Or, if you prefer, it's available in this five-seater as well. The new Dodge Intrepid Sport. This changes everything. Now get 4.9% financing for 60 months or cash back. I want you to defeat the Trojans. He set sail to fight a war for the gods. But when he betrayed them... You cannot stop me! He began the greatest adventure of all time. To find his way home, he will battle against nature, amazing creatures, and the gods themselves. To grow from hero to legend. We're home now. Armando Sante, The Odyssey, coming Sunday, May 18th to NBC. Dateline Friday, the Titanic, disaster struck, but no one knew what really happened until now. A mystery buried in the depths of the sea is uncovered. Secrets of the Titanic, Dateline Friday. Music. Coming to James. Ready announced. Five, four, announced. Here again, Ready is James. James. Two, one. Stop the four, Q James. Now the Dateline timeline. All the following events happened during this, the second week of April. Do you know what year it was? The Houston Astrodome opened as Big League Baseball moved indoors. The House passed the Medicare bill. A memento of my sinful romance, my lover's hand. Look, just look. Betty Davis starred in Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte. The atom bomb with a golf ball. On TV, Duncan pushed a new yo-yo. And remember, if it isn't Duncan, it isn't yo-yo. And a Beatles single was going gold. All right, what year was it? 1965, 1966, or 1967? The answer when Dateline continues. It's a ripoff, a fleecing of America we warned about two years ago. Since then, it's cost you another $6 billion. Congress has done nothing. Why? Watch NBC Nightly News tomorrow. A woman murdered. Her sister assumes her identity. Why don't you show us how you did it? It's a courtroom double cross you must see. <laughs> to believe Law & Order, NBC Wednesday. Here are some of the stories you'll see on 9 News at 10. Some satellites are in danger from the sun. Researchers say these solar flares are causing millions of dollars in damage.
and some very unspring-like weather in Colorado today, but it's nothing compared to the weather over the northern plains. Mother Nature's playing a real cruel joke here. Then, only on 9 News at 10, he doesn't trust the government. You need to prepare for what might be the inevitable. He's the leader of the Montana militia, and he's bringing his beliefs to Colorado. Watch 9 News tonight at 10. What does Oppenheimer Fund's approach to risk management mean? Simple. Every time the market is doing this or that, I don't have to panic. Oppenheimer Funds, the right way to invest. This is Robert Morris, lotto winner number 115. Hey, Robert, solve it. Well? We're here today to see if the see. reason Robert won lotto and you haven't is because he possesses some sort of mathematical genius or some special talent with numbers that makes him different than you. Uh, I'm afraid you'll have to ask someone else. Apparently, he does not, which just goes to show you if it happened to Robert, it could happen to you. KYGO FM is back with Denver's biggest contest. Grab your share of a half million dollars. The KYGO FM Mystery Jukebox Game. A half a million dollars. Wow. That's a lot of money. Tell them how you win. It's easy. Guess the right song and win $5,000. It could be you. Win every weekday at 9, 2, and 5. Show me the money. The KYGO Mystery Jukebox Game. Do you feel lucky? Listen and win. From FM 98.5 KYGO. You can save $3,500 on a 97 Tacoma at the warehouse. Get it at the warehouse. Douglas Toyota, the Toyota warehouse. It's the only way to be sure. Some people find investing exciting. Not me. Oppenheimer Funds goes for long-term performance. I'll take that over excitement any day. Oppenheimer Funds. The right way to invest. I'm Nick Carter. You're watching Channel 9. So what year was it? Betty flipped out. So did Duncan. And Eight Days a Week was a hit. It all happened the second week of April, 1965. From Studio 3B in New York, here again is Jane Pauley. Everyone loves a good love story. Typically, it ends at the altar, and they live happily ever after. Tonight, a love story that begins at the altar, and it's sure to get couples thinking about this question. If you were meeting now for the first time, would he pick you again? Would she fall in love with you all over? Maybe it's a question that's too scary to think about. Now, try living it. Here's Ann Curry. <laughs> Memories like these are supposed to last a lifetime. At least that's what Kim Carpenter thought as he placed the ring on the finger of the love of his life, Cricket Pappas, three years ago. You may kiss your bride. And on that day, Kim <laughs> never dreamed how much his love would be tested. How would you describe this love story? A roller coaster. I mean, where you your peaks are just not rolling hills. They're they're mountainous peaks, and at the very pits, you're at the bottomless lakes. It's not the kind of ride you want to take. Their love story started with a simple phone call, which they even reenacted for their wedding. Good morning, Jammin. Hi. Kim, an assistant athletic director at a university in New Mexico, called a California sportswear company to order some team jackets. Cricket was the sales rep he got on the phone. That first conversation blossomed into much, much more. They started dating and soon became inseparable. I had never felt the chemistry with somebody, a female counterpart like her. And I knew if this, this is it. I mean, this is, this is the person I want to marry. One year later, that's exactly what they did. After honeymooning in Hawaii, Cricket moved to Kim's small town of Las Vegas, New Mexico. They had barely finished unpacking their wedding gifts when it happened. You just never know. In a split second, your life can change. Just like that. It was night. The newlyweds were headed to Cricket's parents' home in Phoenix for Thanksgiving. Kim, feeling sick, was resting in the back seat. Then, on a highway just outside the city of Gallup... I heard, watch out, and the most blood-curdling scream and 
right then I, I looked up and I remember seeing headlights out of Cricket's driver door, mirror, and uh, never saw what we hit. Cricket had swerved to miss a flatbed truck, but then another truck plowed into them from behind. The impact sent their car literally flipping through the air. It was a gruesome crash scene. Kim was badly hurt, but conscious. I heard Cricket just gasp, and I thought, oh my gosh, she died. She knows, I thought it was the last breath of air she could get. And I screamed and screamed and screamed for us. It, to me, she basically didn't have a, a chance in hell of survival. DJ Coombs was the head emergency technician on scene that night. When I approached the car, the car was upside down. It was crunched. Um, the lady was suspended by her seat belt and the steering wheel. Cricket had to be cut out of the car and airlift to Albuquerque, teetering between life and death. When Kim first saw his wife in the emergency room, he was horrified. She was in these seizures, and, you know, like she they had her strapped down, she was fighting to get away. But she was swollen. She had a tube coming right out of her head. I mean, this wire. And I just, I wanted to throw up. Cricket's parents, Mary and Gus Pappas, remember the call that is every parent's worst fear. First he said, Mom, I hurt so bad, and Mom, I can't live without her. When Mary and Gus arrived at the hospital, Cricket was in a coma. Things didn't look good. So they and Kim did the only thing in their power, pray. Finally, 10 days later, Cricket started to emerge from the coma. Your prayers were answered. Right. I mean, to, right on the T. Cricket was alive. Yep. Yeah. She wasn't the same. Nope. In fact, for Kim, the worst was yet to come. Doctors discovered something during a routine test that shocked everyone. As they wrote in her medical records, while questioning Cricket, they found she knew her name, but was disoriented and thought the year was 1965. And that's just the beginning. Kim painfully remembers every word of the rest of the questioning. Who's your mom, Mary? Who's your dad, Gus? And, and they said, well, who's your husband? She didn't say anything. So, who's your husband, Cricket? She said, I'm not married. I felt right then the exact same way that I felt when I didn't know she was alive. It was a devastating blow for Kim. He couldn't believe the love of his life, his soulmate, didn't even know who he was. For months, Cricket went through exhausting rehabilitation in a Phoenix hospital. Kim visited her every single day, all day. But still, she didn't recognize him, no matter what he did. I put pictures of us on both sides of her bed, below the TV, in the mirror of the bathroom, on the wall when she sits on the toilet. I mean, I did everything possible to try, you know, hopefully that she would begin to remember me. And Kim didn't stop there. He reminded Cricket of walks on the beach, movies they'd seen together, gifts she'd given him. He even showed her the printed program from their wedding. Nothing worked. It sounds unbelievable, but experts like neuropsychologist Pam Klonoff, who work with brain-injured patients, say memory loss in severe cases is not as rare as it sounds. Patients lose recollection of events surrounding the time of the injury. They don't recall their exact accident, and they don't recall events preceding the accident. In other words, Cricket was able to remember the distant past, like her parents. But since she met Kim and married him so close to the time of the accident, her memory of him was wiped out. And to make matters worse, Cricket, who was just beginning her rehabilitation, had to learn even the most basic things over again like these patients. Are you ready? Yeah. Go. Green, green. Red, blue. They are learning to recognize simple words again. They're even taught to use a date book so they don't forget to do basic tasks like picking out clothes, brushing teeth, taking showers, just the way Cricket was taught. I watched the therapist teach her how to, to take a shower, how to turn it on, how to get under the shower, how to dry herself, how to put on her clothes, just like you would teach a small child. That's exactly where she was. She was starting her life over again. Through it all, Kim stayed by Cricket's side, even though she still didn't remember him. 
When he had to return to work at the university, he'd shuttle back and forth, traveling 600 miles each week just so he could be with her. Eventually, Cricket began to make progress in physical therapy, but sometimes she'd get so frustrated, she'd turn on Kim. She would tell me she hates me, you know, um, go home, uh, I don't like you, you're mean to me. It was a knife in the back, literally. Kim, a lot of people would not have stuck this out. Huh? Why did you stay with her? I felt like it was my duty. And she would have never married a man who would have walked. Slowly, Cricket regained herself. But she has never regained her memory of the Kim she married. Nonetheless, five months after the accident, Cricket moved home with Kim, accepting on blind faith that she was, in fact, his wife. They became intimate again. But still, Cricket continued to search for anything that would jog her memory. It's so hard to believe that you don't remember mm -hmm. such a huge moment in your life. Mm -hmm. You don't remember any moment, not None even of one moment. You first saw this tape then after the accident. Mm -hmm. Did you believe it was you? It looks like you. Yeah, I believed it was me, but it was kind of weird to watch it because I don't know what the girl in the picture is thinking or feeling, and it looks like everyone's having a great time, but I don't have any feeling of it. Sure. Cricket had to force herself to accept that those memories were gone, and all this began to take a toll on her relationship with Kim. The two found themselves arguing as never before over petty things like what time to go to the movies, lost eyeglasses, and whether or not to go biking. Even when Cricket returned to work as an exercise specialist at the University Health Club, things were still tense. Then a counselor suggested something that most married couples would never think of, to act as if they were single again. You dated? Yeah. Dated? Yeah. <laughs> Talking movies? Go to the show and go eat pizza or drive to Santa Fe, go bowling. Flowers? Yep. Oh, she gave you flowers? <laughs> oh, yeah. I was, you know, once we realized there was no memory, I was about to leave a bad impression. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> come on. Little by little, through dates like this to the zoo, the two fell in love all over again. It was really neat for me to see who this man was that I married, and I like what I saw. Hey, Kim, you want her back. You want her a second time. She fell in love with me not once, but twice. <laughs> I'm a man. <laughs> and at that point, they thought there was only one thing left to do. A second wedding. That's right. This time, it wasn't a big church, but a rustic one in the foothills of the Rockies. Cricket wore the same dress. There were most of the same bridesmaids and ushers, the whole nine yards. But there was one key difference. Among the guests at this wedding were some of the very people, the emergency technicians and therapists, who made the day possible. I love you, babe. Kim, you have two weddings in your memory. Which one means more to you? Oh, the second one. Without a doubt. Only one thing can surpass forever the painful events that we have felt. That is the love I have for you. I need you, Cameron, mm -hmm. and I love you. Cricket, when you heard those words coming from a man who had stuck by you, what did they mean to you? I was really thankful to finally have a memory of marrying this man and that it wasn't just a story anymore. It was our new beginning. A new beginning in a story about the courage of a man and a woman who had every reason to give up on their marriage, but didn't, and who now feel that they can face anything the future may hold. Isn't it pretty out here? It's beautiful. All the struggles that we've had to fight through have definitely um, deepened and strengthened our love, probably a lot farther than it would have been if this car accident never happened. We have true love. And I honestly feel that. Mm -hmm. Nobody can take that away from us. Now that Cricket has a new set of memories, what about the missing years? Well, it's now been more than three years since Cricket's accident, and experts at Barrow Neurological Institute, where she went through rehabilitation, tell us that if she's not recovered her memory by now, 
She probably never will. Coming up next, Jim Jones, David Koresh, and now, Marshall Applewhite. How did these men create cults so committed that followers were willing to kill themselves? This is the happiest day of my life. <laughs> Plus, the Atlanta Braves plumbing problem on Dateline's Picture of the Week. There's only one garage that's filled to capacity with these top brand tires. Sears Auto Center. And right now, select Michelin tires are on sale at guaranteed unbeatable prices. And remember, the pressure's on us to deliver. Select Michelin tires on sale at Sears. No matter what's parked in your garage, chances are you'll find a tire for it in ours. It won't print. It still won't print. It still won't print. It won't, it won't print. print. Jiggle the cable. I jiggled. I'll jiggle again. That's the light. That's the light? That's the light. It won't print. It won't print. It won't print. What's the problem with the printer? It won't print. Can you print? It's not the printer. It's the computers. Hadley downloaded a virus off the web. Hadley. IBM protects your network. For all of us who couldn't wait to get out of high school. You're a great house. You've been. Since you stood me up on prom night. Comes the story of a man. What have you been doing with your life? Professional killer. Do you have to do postgraduate work for that? Who's looking for a second shot. Welcome home. I'm in love. How do we can make this relationship work? Gross point blank. You're a psycho. Don't rush to judgment on something like that. Ready to R. Starts Friday, April 11th at a theater near you. Pardon me. Wow, that's some breath. Oh, I agree. I've enjoyed your breath ever since 96th Street. Thank you very much. Want the ultimate fresh breath? Try Breath Savers Ooh. with its cool, minty core. <sighs> breath Savers. Would you like to try Snackwell cereal bars? I've got strawberry, banana, and raspberry. Really fruity. I want to try the other ones. Sorry, I have to save some for the other people. Mother. Yeah? Loaded with real fruit filling. Snackwell's fat-free cereal bars. Later on in All New Tonight Show, friends Lisa Kudrow has a little confession to make. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have taken Joey and Chandler's apartment home. Plus actor Dennis Farina and boxing superstar Oscar De La Hoya's new trainer, Iron J. Can you give me some advice on my deltoids? Deltoids? <laughs> Listen, I don't even watch Star Trek, okay? <laughs> then Conan's got Rob Lowe tonight. Saturday. Oh, what a tangled web we weave. One of their own murdered. It's not a game this time. I just found him. One of their own. It's my operation, so back off. Is the killer. Could be revenge. Just watch my back for me, son. I will see justice done. You're accusing me. Maybe you killed him. All new profiler on the NBC Saturday trilogy. Two diaries found in a garbage dump and apparently written by members of Heaven's Gate in the months before they died. They may offer new insight into the cult. One entry casually lists their recipe for death. Quote, one hour before, tea and toast. Then, ten pills and vodka. More proof, as if we needed it, of the powerful grip Marshall Applewhite had on his followers. But still, no answers to the one most puzzling question of all. How did Applewhite gain that power? Tonight, Dawn Fertangelo on how cult leaders cast their spell. We may never really know the question that is on everyone's mind, why did they do this? For so many of us, it all seems so bizarre. We're on the threshold of the end of this civilization because it's about to be recycled. Strange people, we think, saying and doing even stranger things. The estimate of the dead at the Jonestown camp in Guyana is now 780. Sometimes with catastrophic consequences like this and like this and now like this the gruesome task now of removing 39 bodies still these cult leaders who seem so let's face it crazy to us can engender religious devotion among their followers so we wondered how do they do it how do they create a cult so committed so submissive so utterly devoted that followers are willing to die at their command because their death isn't death to them. It's the beginning of eternal life. Robert J. Lifton is a professor of psychiatry at the City University of New York. 
he says essential to the success of any cult leader like Jim Jones is his personal charisma and sense of grandiosity. He creates a euphoria among his clan, and that makes members susceptible to his commands. These gurus are very complicated people. They can have some genuine traits of social and religious leadership, along with profoundly paranoid traits, along with antisocial traits, along with self-destructive and suicidal traits, along with murderous traits. People play games, friend. Lifton says cult leaders convince followers that they are immortal and their immortality can be transferred to them. That leads to strange behavior in our eyes. How do you get people to believe that, one, the leader's an alien, and if they're a follower, they're an alien, and that a spaceship is going to come and get them? Well, any extreme group is likely to draw upon the immediate images and mythology of its society and culture. That mythology extends back more than a thousand years. The Book of Revelation foretells the violent end of the world. And the 16th century astrologer Nostradamus predicted the world would end at precisely the beginning of the year 2000. What is it about David Koresh, Jim Jones, Charles Manson? What did they possess? What every one of them has in common is the capacity to convey to followers a sense that they have renewed energy and life power. Lifton has just returned from Japan, where he's been studying the Am Shinrikyo cult. It was two years ago that the group released deadly sarin gas into the Tokyo subway system, killing 12 and injuring 5,000. Lifton says their leader, like other cult leaders, such as Marshall Applewhite of Heaven's Gate, tap into and validate the fears and concerns of their followers. When I talked to people from Om Shinrikyo, the Japanese cult, they said that the Guru Asahara said things that I felt and believed. And as soon as I heard him say that, I knew he was the mentor for me. And I'm sure that's the way people felt about Applewhite. These people may have come to Mr. Applewhite with a sense of despair and loss somewhere deep inside themselves already. Yes, it could have been despair and loss. It might have been less than despair, but some sense of emptiness and confusion. I believe that David Koresh uh, was divinely inspired. I believe that he was a messiah of sorts. And this is exactly what experts like Robert Lifton are talking about. David Thibodeau was a member of David Koresh's Branch Davidian cult. It appears that Koresh and most of his followers were consumed by the flames. When the government raided the compound in Waco, Texas, Thibodeau was one of those who got out alive. He says he slipped out a side window. He was arrested and held briefly. I believe in David's inspiration, 100%. I still do to this day. If I'm not agreeing with him, I'm simply not agreeing with the words that God put down in the book. When you listen to David Thibodeau, you're listening to a true believer. Someone who sees David Koresh as an immensely misunderstood prophet who received messages directly from God. We should admit to ourselves that we don't know what the prophets have taught. He took a Bible and he put it up to his forehead. And he said, no, when I see the scripture, I don't see this cover and all these pages. I see cover to cover panoramically. ATF, you boys are wrong. Thibodeau takes issue with experts like Robert Lifton, who argue that the personal charisma of cult leaders like David Koresh is at the heart of their success. He says it's much more than that. For instance, Thibodeau says he could be utterly confused by a page of scripture. And then here's this guy, this little, this, this hick from, from Waco, Texas, that just opens his mouth and makes it so clear you can't believe you could never see it before. That, of course, is precisely what defines so many cult leaders, from Charles Manson to Jim Jones to David Koresh and now to Marshall Applewhite. Welcome to Beyond Human that ability to put into words what their followers have always believed. They offer hope and clarity to people who feel society and mainstream religion have failed them, no matter how intelligent they are. How does a cult leader like Marshall Applewhite convince smart people to join him? Intelligence is not necessarily a barrier to embrace of a guru. In other words, the issue is not intelligence. The issue is hunger for what the guru promises. Very happy to, to be here. And if experts on cults can agree on one thing, it is that as we approach the year 2000, 
that hunger is likely to grow, and scenes like this may grow increasingly familiar. Here comes the body right now. An answer this week to at least one of the mysteries surrounding Heaven's Gate, from the former cult member who discovered the mass suicide. Rio D'Angelo tells Newsweek, the reason the cult stockpiled weapons near the San Diego mansion was because Marshall Applewhite feared he was being stalked by the FBI. Rio also says he believes the cult members would like all of the attention they're getting right now, because before the suicide, no one would listen. Coming up next, a major league leak on Dateline's Picture of the Week. Dateline will continue after this message from your local station. Coming up next. I couldn't really think how anybody could have survived that accident. North Glen High School mourns the loss of a friend. Also, solar flares threaten to destroy millions of dollars in satellite technology. Nine News is next. 1892, toothpaste is invented. 1955, fluoride. 1985, tartar control. Now, tartar control toothpaste from Listerine that keeps fighting germs for a long-lasting clean. Introducing Cool Mint Listerine tartar control toothpaste. It keeps fighting germs even after you stop brushing so that clean feeling lasts. Finally, new Cool Mint Listerine tartar control toothpaste. Look for the dollar coupon this Sunday. If you've been working for a favorite look, those are great. Yep. Mm -hmm. Part of getting that look should be including Kellogg's Special K. Great toasted taste, 110 calories, and fat-free. Buy them. <laughs> Buy Kellogg's Special K. Great taste never looks so good. Yeah. <laughs> Incredibly, match life. The dependable one-match charcoal from Kingsman is ready to cook on in just 15 minutes. So, the sooner you get match life, the sooner you eat. Cool Water. Cool Water Woman. A new favorite by Davidoff. Here's Tom Brokaw with a program note. Thanks, Jane. Tomorrow it's a government giveaway, a fleecing of America that we warned about two years ago. Since then, it's cost taxpayers another $6 billion. Congress has done nothing. Why? You can find out tomorrow on NBC Nightly News. Stone? Thanks, Tom. Now let's take a look at one of the stories we're working on for Dateline Friday. The federal prison said his death was a suicide by hanging. But his family was shocked when they saw his body. His head had been smashed in three places. His throat was torn open. What happened in that cell? The medical examiner wants answers. And now, a powerful senator is asking questions. Was there a cover-up here? Is there a cover-up here? A troubling death in federal detention. The story on Dateline Friday. Finally tonight, proving that when it rains, it really does pour. From Turner Field in Atlanta, we call our picture of the week April showers. Rain had already delayed the game three hours, but just as Fred McGriff sprayed a hit to left, Ted Turner's brand new diamond sprung a leak. The unexpected downpour was precipitated by the automatic sprinklers, which went off exactly as scheduled at midnight. Plumbing problems didn't dampen the brave spirit. They went on to drown the Cubs 11 to 5. That's all for this edition of Dateline. Join us again for Dateline Friday at 9, 8 central. Now stay tuned for your local news. I'm Jane Pauley. For all of us at NBC News, good night. Later, Jay gets by with a little help from his friends, Lisa Kudrow, actor Dennis Farina, and boxing champ Oscar De La Hoya. Stay up for Jay. Your local news is next.
Coming up, the flood of 97 is raging across the northern plains. Residents prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And in weather, I'll tell you if spring will return to the metro area. And a letter by Tim McVeigh written from his jail cell. Nine News is next.